Hi, I'm Kari Greger. Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to talk about estrangement. We didn't choose to be separated from our adult children. They chose it. Why? Well, now that's the question, isn't it? We never received an understandable answer. We apologized for what we thought we'd done. I guess it wasn't enough. After reaching out for a year, we said we would wait until they were ready to talk. And we asked them to communicate when that time came. That was six years ago. They blocked us on social media. They moved, concealing their new addresses, and never got back to us. We were cancelled. It's like a forensic investigation trying to figure out what happened. Because they have gone totally no contact. Yes, their peers had influence and the church they joined, and the therapy they received. Those were all factors. This one is about the suspicious quality of the counseling available there at the church or whoever they recommended, based on the results that we have seen, i.e. no contact, no explanation. I'm going to read an excerpt of a magazine, a Psychopotherapy Network. The article is titled, When Therapists Encourage Family Cutoffs, Are We Helping or Harming? It's written by Dr. Joshua Coleman, and the link is going to be in the description below. The article is based on his book, Rules of Estrangement, which I just recently read. And um, I'm just taking some excerpts out of it. I'm skipping over some of the content. He starts out the article with an illustration from a patient or a, a son and a mother that he had come to his studio, um, his clinic, I guess is a better word for it. I'm skipping to the part after he's done the beginning of the illustration and when he starts explaining what's going on. Therapists can do a lot of damage. We can encourage a divorce from a spouse who's more amiable to change than we realize, harming the lives of the client and her children. We can encourage someone to stay in a marriage that creates ongoing depression for him or his kids. We can support a parent who cuts an adult child out of a will without confronting how much he has contributed to the child's negative behavior. We can support an adult child's decision to end a relationship with a parent without being sensitive to how that decision may affect the client, his children, and the parent who's being cut off. Perhaps a more important problem than blind spots resulting from our inexperience, unexamined prejudices, or limited orientations is that the therapist's perspectives often uncritically reflect the biases, vogues, and fads of the culture in which we live. If you were a therapist in the 1950s and a woman showed up at your office claiming she was unfulfilled in her role as a mother and a housewife, most likely your goal would not be to propel her into a career or into more meaningful activities outside of the house. Instead, you would investigate what prevented her from being um, happy with what other women ostensibly are so contented. Her boredom or lack of fulfillment with domesticity, an ideal with the culture at the time, would be viewed as a neurosis to be treated with medication and psychoanalysis. Uh, which was, that's very true. 
One of the more profound ways that our culture has changed in the past century is its embrace of the individual as separate from the family and the community at large. Today's culture of therapy both reflects and contributes to our nation's ever-growing embrace of individualism. While Prior to the 1960s, the aims of psychotherapy were to generate and encourage people to conform to the institutional dictates of the time. Today's therapists and self-help authors want to help their clients become more resistant to the forces of guilt, shame, and worry about others that stand in the way of them developing their talents and pursuing their dreams. To that end, family members have increasingly become viewed as facilitators of, or obstacles to, a fully realized life, rather than uh, necessary and forgivable features in an expectedly imperfect existence. While the family was once where individuals located themselves in chronological and social order, it now comprises the institution from which, from which they must be liberated. With the exception of parenting small children, Encouraging individuals to feel some sense of obligation or care for family members is not typically in the therapist's agendas. As a result, an adult child's psychotherapy can sometimes increase family conflict and distance. Unless a client requests help in having a better relationship with the parent, sibling, grandparents, or in-laws, most therapists worry too much, worry that too much emphasis on the needs or feelings of the person outside of the room will be antithetical to helping their client focus on their own needs, which is, after all, the point of much therapy today. So they don't care about the other person. They're concentrating on their client, which, okay, I can see that. I can see when somebody comes to you, they have a problem and the therapist wants to help them solve that problem. And they're not concerned with who's outside the room. You know, the, those people aren't paying their fee. Okay. As therapists, we hold up the ideal parent or family experience as a way to shine a light on what the adult's life might have been if she'd had better parenting. This serves the purpose of helping our client not blame herself for self-limiting and self-hating voices and to allow her distance from parents and others whose contact, contact tends to amplify that voice rather than diminish it. It also allows a creative space to imagine what she might feel or accomplish without the critical voices that may have brought her into therapy in the first place, whatever the origin. Okay, so we're gonna, their, their idea is to get rid of those parent voices that are making them feel guilty or whatever and concentrate on the client. All right, All right. I can see this. Let's continue. Helping adult children see what they didn't get and what they should have gotten ideally from parents is one of the biggest tools in the therapist's tool chest and one that I go to on a daily basis. That's Dr. Coleman, not me. I'm not a therapist. <laughs> An analysis of a ch client's childhood is useful because parents and siblings can powerfully shape identity, self-esteem, feelings of trust or safety in the world, and later one's ability to parent. 
Psychotherapists can be efficacious teachers about the relationship between the adults functioning as an adult and the family's contribution to those inadequacies, deficits, and conflicts. So we're trying to remove the parents and all the voices and see, oh, you know, this is what you you didn't get that you should have gotten, you know, ideally, in the perfect world. But there's a downside to that. In doing so, the therapists tempt the adult child to feel contempt or even hatred for their parents. They may encourage their anger because anger is powerful. It can carry anger away from the self, self-hating. In blaming others, we are relieved of the self-blame, the shame, and the guilt we feel about our defects and our failures. Anger is active. It can cause us to feel like we're pushing back rather than feeling victimized by the outcomes of our lives. But in the same way that hating the sin or hating the sinner still involves hate, supporting anger or contempt for a parent doesn't necessarily free the adult child from, from that from which they hope to be freed. You can't... One thing I will say is that and this is me, you can't get your parents' voices out of your head, like cutting them off, in, because when you grow up, that's the voice that you hear. They were part of your development, and cutting them off isn't going to be the answer to getting them out of your head. I mean, I could understand a time out, but let's get back to this. Okay. Family therapy with Jeremy and his mom. This is the example that he used in the beginning of the, um, of the article. This is what he said. You chose to stay in bed with your depression when I was young instead of deciding to get up and fix yourself, he began. And as a result, I've had a much harder time knowing how to do basic things in life or prioritize my own needs in relationships. My therapist said that I was parentified by you and that you were emotionally incestuous with me growing up. That's why I haven't wanted to talk to you. I needed to work on myself. I had wanted him to be a direct, but I also knew that I would need to translate his words. Products of his own therapy which undeciphered sound like the worst kind of character assaults. Emotional incest, parentified, narcissistic personality disorder. These are the flora and fauna of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual and can sound pretty humiliating to those on the receiving end. Softening the bite of psychiatric diagnoses is especially important since they are now an active part of mainstream culture. We call someone borderline or a total narcissist when we used to say jerks or assholes. We might still call them that, but putting it in context of a diagnosis sounds so much more authoritative. This is something that we've run into because the last communication with one of our children, he told us that we were unhealthily enmeshed emotionally as a family. <laughs> it, come, it came straight out of a therapist's office. I don't know. Oh. Okay. Do people choose to be bad parents? There is often less free will when it comes to parenting than most realize. Parents are as much under the throes of their genetic dictates, partner provocations, childhood traumas, financial threats, and community deprivations as are the children being parented. 
Sherry's deficits in parenting stemmed not only from her own parents' deficits, but also from her financial struggles, her genetic and em environmental vulnerability to depression, and her lack of having another parent with whom to share responsibility in raising her son. Our current construction of causality in the family, where therapeutic discourses lead people to believe that choice is the organizing and guiding principle of life. That often creates more conflict in families than it solves. From Jeremy's perspective, his depressed mother should have or could have just pulled herself up by her bootstraps, gotten out of bed, and marched herself into a therapist's office. This is the thing. Whatever, we don't know what was the problem with our kids. But I think that we've been reduced to, you know, oh, your parents are this. When real life has much more nuance. There's things that happen in life that you react to in the moment. You know, we aren't given a manual in how to raise our kids. We've learned how to do it. We, and it's not perfect. It's never perfect. This estrangement though, makes it so that we have no say. And you know, it's our fault. We should have been better. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? For the child under a therapist's guidance to later look back and say that a, ther that a parent should have known better or behaved differently, that they now deserve the distance, if not contempt they receive, is wrong. It suggests that the parent was handed a map for a geography that wasn't yet charted when they were raising their children and given resources that were beyond their reach. This is not in any way to minimize the enormous amount of damage, sometimes permanent, that problematic parenting can cause. Children raised by those who are emotionally or physically abusive or neglectful due to mental illness or alcohol or drug addiction, know firsthand the pain that can be caused by parents. That pain can radiate out into all of the aspects of his life. So that's a very good disclaimer. There is a case, there are those cases where the parents were so terribly abusive and and you know this is the this is the problem is finding our way in all of this because we were not those parents we were not abusive social services wasn't coming knocking on the door you know our kids were commended as being model children we had other parents coming to us and asking us what did you do? Your children are so respectful and so nice and, and so Christian. So that's a good disclaimer to get out of the way. We're not talking about those kind of parents that have had that, you know, I mean, not that they deserve any kind of uh, distancing. I'm not saying that. It's just that, you know, those, those relationships have issues that, that need to be gone through with a therapist and need to be highlighted. But what we're talking about is an average, even better than average upbringing that has been put under a microscope of scrutiny. Okay, back to Dr. Coleman. Misdiagnosing the parent. Jeremy's therapist wasn't wrong that his mother needed more love, caretaking, and tenderness than could be reasonably expected to provide, than he could be reasonably expected to provide. Nor that the incompatibility of their temperaments may have created genuine suffering in him. In my experience, many therapists misdiagnose a mother's maternal depression as narcissism. Depressed mothers can be more needy, anxious, and sometimes disparaging. Therapists might interpret this dis 
depression as narcissism or some other personality disorder. Did Jeremy's mother have a narcissistic personality disorder? As he and his therapist believed, she did not. More important, that diagnosis foreclosed the possibility that they could get together and build a bridge of understanding where Jeremy, without guilt or regret, could accept the limitations of what he could or should have provide his mother, and his mother could accept, without bitterness or complaints to her son, that his care and attention would never be enough to make up for the difficult hand that life had dealt her before and after becoming a parent. Jerry's mother, Jeremy's mother did deserve a better life. It wasn't necessarily her son who could provide it. And Jeremy deserved a better life too. It just wasn't necessary, necessarily his mother's fault that he lacked it. Giving the mother a psychiatric diagnosis, especially one as outsized and definitive as narcissistic personality disorder, greatly oversimplifies her life and struggles. It devalues her years of love and dedication, however flawed, and it weakens the fabric of connection that could otherwise have existed. She deserved a different narrative, one that was deeper, more compassionate, that saw her less as a freewheeling agent, more as someone responding to what life offered her from what she had to offer in return. I suspect, as I have indicated earlier, that uh, we have been diagnosed from a therapist's office 900 miles away, and we have been categorized and put into a little box so that we could be rejected. All in the, in the um, endeavor to provide our child with the self-esteem and strength that they needed to find themselves, to do the work on themselves. Okay, but we've been slapped with a label that we don't deserve. I continue. Dr. Coleman continues. I, I sometimes discover underneath the contempt a client feels for the parent she has rejected, a deep reservoir of sadness for that parent and longing for them to be happy. What some adult children find oppressive about their parent may not be the parent's personality disorder, as is so commonly highlighted in therapy offices and on, on forums, forums, but the weight of their own feelings of empathy. For the adult child, the decision to estrange the parent, however painful, is nonetheless tied to a narrative of liberation from oppressive forces and the pursuit of happiness. There is no equivalent upside for the parent. It's all downside. Failing at life's most important task, being denied the valued reflection of oneself as a parent, feeling shame before one's peers and family, losing not only the adult child, but often the relationship to cherished grandchildren, and for those parents who are all too aware of their parental failures, they also lose the opportunity to do for grandchildren what they couldn't for their own children. <laughs> I think that this is a lot of what's been going on with at least one of our children is that they have so much em empathy for us that they have trouble being close to us and they needed to have a separation because it was too burdensome. You know, the thing is, they're not responsible for our happiness. They're not responsible for making us get over our problems, I don't understand how that perspective became, but now they're 
inability to deal with their empathy and an inability to provide separation has caused a lot of pain to us. A lot of infliction of sorrow that we don't deserve because they can't deal with their empathy. Now it's our fault and we have to suffer for it. I really find that problematic because we have had no contact. We are missing growing, the growing up of our, our grandchildren. We've heard that we have two grandchildren, but you know, we've never been informed officially of that. And we're completely cut out because our child didn't have the strength of character to be able to negotiate or to um, reconcile with us. We never received an instruction manual. We certainly did not have access to all this therapeutic mumble jumble that they had absorbed. We didn't understand what was going on. Anyway, I get back to Dr. Coleman. Reconciliation, reconciliation therapy between parents and adult children is similar to couples therapy, where one member is willing to call it quits. For those open to dis considering a deep examination of the found foundational problems in the relationship, a marriage can sometimes be saved and in many cases made better than ever. The same can be said for estranged parents and their adult children. Um, so this was by Dr. Joshua Coleman, uh, 2022, January, February edition of um, the Psychotherapy Network. There you go. Our children are being unduly influenced by advisors, therapists, counselors, who are slapping labels on the parents and in the end saying, you know, they're that way, they're never going to change and you don't need to reach out for them. Well, we have n not been given an avenue to even look at what we were wrong about. I'm sure, I know we did things wrong as parents. Everybody, all parents do. But being held up next to the ideal and saying, because you didn't meet that ideal, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. There's got to be some more conversation than that. You know, the Bible says, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. It's a commandment. Our children are disobeying a commandment. Thank you for watching.